Good afternoon and welcome to the Origins of Tragedy, or Origins of Tragedy, as, as we've called it. I'm Francis Levy, Ed Mastestian, and I are co-directors of the Philip Tatey Center. And before we begin this afternoon's event, uh, I wanted to give you some announcements about up-and-coming Philip Tatey's activities. And we are very much alive and kicking. We just got a grant from the Educational Foundation of America. Yay! I'm very, very happy. <laughs> We didn't even ask for this grant. I'm getting to the point where I'm thinking that it's the old thing, you know, that my wife always says I'm too anxious, I'm demanding. Maybe what I should do is do nothing and <laughs> uh, be, be stoic. Um, but uh, the art exhibit you see on the wall was related to our panel uh, from the uh, WPA to the NEA, and we had uh, Rocco Lenzman, who was chairman of the NEA, <coughs> he, NEA here with Kate Levin from the DCA. Uh, it was a fascinating panel, and many Philoctetes panels, if not all, I should say all Philoctetes panels, which are curated by Hallie Cohn, who stands right there, and Adam Ludwig, uh, are tied into our roundtables. And take a close look at this one. Those uh, uh, posters on the wall over there uh, by Janine Menlove are kind of are based upon WPA era iconography. And we have printed some. How did it work? Did she organize? She has printed some of those, and they, there are a few left. So if you would like to buy one, they are on sale afterwards for $10 each, and they are a wonderful thing to possess. Also, on the wall over here is Eric Lindvet Velt. Eric Lind Eric Lindvet's The Sylvan Natural History of New York. Now, Hallie, did you, would you just, in terms of, there was something extremely unusual about the construction of, of these works. Paper and um, some sawdust and pigment, and it's quite a remarkable uh, technical you know, tour de force. And uh, in addition, it, there's a wonderful uh, sensibility that he brings to uh, you know, the, the study of nature yeah, so take a close look. Sometimes people walk into Philoctetes and they just think this is the, 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 what you see on the walls is gratuitous. It is not. It's intentional. Um, on October 23rd, many of you may remember Marie Ponceau, a poet who has appeared at Philoctetes, very distinguished poet, has appeared at Philoctetes many times. The Times wrote up the fact uh, this past spring that she had had a stroke and is now suffering from aphasia. She proposed a panel on aphasia, and so she is coming with uh, Jason Brown, the prominent neurologist, and a panel uh, composed of another poet, um, and Dorothy Roth, a speech pathologist, uh, and Jackson Brown, who's head of the graduate program in writing at the New School, and they're all going to be talking about Aphasia, recovering syntax, a poet's struggle with aphasia, which is a quintessentially, naturally, Philoctetes type activity. And this will be a real working chance to see many of the things we've talked about for years uh, in, in, a, in, in a panel situation. So um, um, please try to make it to that. On October 29th, poetry continues at Philoctetes with two programs organized by the Academy of American Poets. At 1.30, it's Emerging Poets with Megan O'Rourke, who's a fantastic poet, Jericho Brown, Tina Chang, Olena Kati, Kati, Kali Tiak Davis, and Mark Wunderlich. And at 3.30, the noted classicist and poet Ann Carson will be giving the Blaney Lecture. On October 30th, we have the imagination of Hamlet, and it's not really clear whose imagination we're dealing with in that panel. Is it Hamlet's imagination? Is it the playwright's imagination? Or is it the imagination of the, uh, propri the, the, the proposers of the panel who are trying to understand both Shakespeare and Hamlet at the same time? And we promise you that Ernest Jones will not be invoked in this <laughs> discussion, or, or maybe. Uh, on, on, Nove on November 6th, we prevent, present a roundtable uh, about... Hitchcock's Vertigo. We're going to be showing the movie Vertigo, and it's called Finding Equilibrium in Vertigo. Uh, so uh, that should be an exciting event. And that uh, Brigitte Pucher, who did the uh, Poiker, who did the uh, In the Year of the Thirteen Moons roundtable, which some of you may have seen at the Fassbinder film here at Philotetes, she's presiding over that event. And that was an, an amazing, uh, I don't know, uh, you know, an amazing uh, activity that we put on here. We showed the film, and then we had a long and, and very, very complex discussion about 
the film. And uh, we hope to have a very interesting and not complex discussion about Vertigo on the 6th. Our Life in Poetry, our ongoing poetry series directed by publisher Mike Braziller, continues on November 11th with Frank O'Hara and Mark Doty and David Lehman, two distinguished figures in modern American poetry, will be joining Mike for that program. On November 14th, music continues at Philotetes with Stephanie Chase presenting a program entitled From Muse to Music, Exploring the Craft of the American Art Song. And, and those of you who come to the music program uh, know that we do a jazz improvisation series, and Stephanie has more handled the classical side of Philotetes programming. So she's returning to do that and igniting her classical music season. Uh, consult our calendar. You go to philoctetes.org. It's all on the, uh, on the site. All Philoctetes programming is also on the site. If you go to the left side of the homepage, you can see under past programming, you can see all Philoctetes roundtables. Today's roundtable should appear in about two or three days, and we're also on YouTube. Um, so, and uh, even in spite of the fact that I did announce the grant we've gotten, we depend on all of you for support, uh, gr grants that we receive are generally aimed at particular programs, and we need a certain amount of money just to survive. So we, we have, you have been very generous, and we would very much we appreciate your ongoing support of Philoctetes. I'm now pleased to present Gareth Williams. Gareth Williams is professor of classics at Columbia University, where he has taught since 1992. He is a specialist in Latin literature of the late Roman Republican and early imperial eras, spanning the first centuries BCE and CE. He has written extensively on the Roman poets of the age of Augustus, including two books on Ovid. In later work, he has shifted focus to the philosophical and poetic tragic writings of the younger Seneca, the Stoic philosopher and statesman who served as young Nero's intimate advisor until he fell into imperial dis <clears throat> disfavor in the early 60s CE. Williams is currently completing a study of Seneca's important writings on natural science and more specifically on the correlation drawn in Greco-Roman antiquity between the physical workings of the world and the human moral condition. Professor Williams will moderate this afternoon's panel Panel and introduce our other distinguished guests. So, you're still going to find out because he's right here. <laughs> okay. Francis, can I first say thank you very much indeed for the invitation to okay. appear here this afternoon? It's a pleasure and a privilege to be here. And, and we're so honored to have you. That. Um, I'm a Romanist. That may strike some of you as strange given the highly tragic Greek content that we have today. I hope to turn that to advantage at some point, though, in the proceedings of the afternoon. Um, first of all, though, I would like the four very distinguished speakers and participants uh, to introduce themselves briefly, please. Oh, am I the one who starts? Well, uh, I am Gregory Naj, and I am a professor at Harvard University. I'm also director of the Center for Hellenic Studies in Washington, D.C., which was founded by Paul Mellon, who thought it would be important for an organization to be outside the ivory tower and to get the message out there to the world. And it seemed to him that Washington was the place where people of wealth, power, and prestige congregate and not Cambridge, Massachusetts, I guess. Yeah. Uh, and just very quickly, to introduce myself about who I am, uh, I was an undergraduate at Indiana University uh, in the uh, late 50s and early 60s, and I just did plain old Bloomfieldian linguistics, which was great, and I was a classics minor, and then my professors thought it would be a great idea to go to Harvard, and uh, that's where I wound up. And there, they didn't have Bloomfieldian linguistics at the time, so I did historical linguistics. And, but officially, I was in the classics department, and I did a PhD thesis on Zephyr's Law, which is about as um, linguistic as you can get. And for some reason, I still got into the faculty after my PhD, and I realized I had to reinvent myself several times. So I went from historical linguistics, especially in Indo-European languages, to comparative metrics, from comparative metrics to study of formula. Then I realized, gee, if I study formula, I have to know about the content as well. So how about Homeric themes? I did that. And meanwhile, time went on, and I got promoted and didn't get promoted, all those stories. And in the end, I realized, gee, if I'm a Homerist, I have to do um, other forms of literature as well. And I went from archaic period to classical period. And now I'm where Gareth is, which is I realized that Virgil and Ovid are the, uh, are the best source for understanding Greek civilization. So that's my story. <laughs> 
Uh, my name is Stephen Scully. I'm in the classics department at Boston University. Uh, and I, my undergraduate days were here in New York at NYU. Uh, and I think that really it was New York City that made me a classicist that was thinking about New York, loving New York, that, that drew me to Greek literature. Um, and then I went on to get my PhD at Brown uh, under uh, Charles Siegel. Uh, I'm also a Homerist. I uh, started out with Homer, um, more from the thematic than from the formulaic side. Uh, and I, like Greg, I think I'm continually reinventing myself. Uh, I, my interest in Homer uh, is an abiding one, but uh, I, I have a tremendous interest in the Renaissance, uh, the classical tradition, uh, uh, Latin poetry. Um, I, I like to dabble. I've, I've translated some Plato, some Greek tragedy. Uh, and presently, I'm working on a book on Hesiod's Theogony, and it's um, shadows and influences up through Milton. Uh, my name is Alexander Nehamas, and I teach uh, philosophy and comparative literature at Princeton. I was born in Greece, and but I never got to like the Greeks, as I was just saying, <laughs> until I came to America, where I went to Swarthmore College, where Martin Oswald was uh, a great uh, classicist and a great influence on me. I then uh, went to Princeton, where I spent a a semester in the classics department before um, they decided that I wasn't good enough to the, for them and sent me over to philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I have been teaching very, I taught at the University of Pittsburgh, Penn, and now I'm at uh, Princeton again. Um, so I'm interested in, in Greek philosophy, uh, particularly Plato. Uh, I'm interested in Nietzsche. Uh, and it's very difficult to put Plato and Nietzsche together, so <laughs> I'm one in the morning, the other in the afternoon, usually. <laughs> and um, I'm also very interested in philosophy of art, so my last book was on uh, beauty and reclaiming beauty, and I'm now working on something on friendship, which is connected with the other, so thank you. I'm Joe Ledoux, I'm at NYU. Um, a couple of days before this panel, Gareth sent around an email welcoming, welcoming us to the, uh, the panel and saying that as a Latinist, he felt out of place amongst all the Hellenists, <laughs> so you can imagine how I feel. Uh, I, um, I grew up in Louisiana, and I studied marketing at LSU. I uh, got a master's in marketing, and in the process, uh, became interested in why consumers buy the things they buy, and became more and more involved in psychology and uh, psychological motivation, which led me to experimental psychology and ultimately to the brain, all in a very short, this happened in about two months. But uh, <laughs> um, I started working in a laboratory on the brain at LSU and decided I wanted to go to graduate school in that. So I um, uh, switched gears, um, somehow managed to get into graduate school at Stony Brook and did my PhD there. And ever since, I've been working on emotions in the brain and especially uh, fear. And sometimes um, emotions are described, uh, I think using a quote from Plato, where he talked about the emotions as the wild horses that had to be reined in by the charioteer. And that may be all I have to say about classics today. <laughs> Thank you. Well, can I just set the ball rolling by really asking, what is it that we're actually trying to talk about this afternoon? And can I just propose a distinction to begin with? Um, when we begin to think about Greek tragedy, what is the tragedy that we're talking about? Is tragedy the literary form that has become so famous, of course, in the modern world through the writings of Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides, and the fragmentary writings of other tragedians? Is tragedy a literary form? Or, on the other hand, is tragedy more a sensibility? As one looks at the Iliad or reads Herodotus, the historian, or Thucydides, there are many passages in these different, very diverse writers that might be called tragic. And the outlook in the Thucydides might be viewed as perhaps tragic. So I wonder if, as a starting point, we might begin to think about, well, what is the tragedy we're talking about? Is Sophocles, is Aeschylus writing a form of literature that is symptomatic of a broader tragic sensibility? Or indeed, does tragedy as we know it evolve out of the dramas those people wrote? Perhaps we could start with that. 
You should uh, point at someone. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> that side. Well, may I say something linguistic? Uh, th- th- that would always be a safe way to start. And, and uh, I can tell you that my early works uh, were, let's say in the 70s, where I talked about reconstructing and talked about the original this and original that. Now that I'm rewriting that, I, I take out all original the, the word doesn't exist anymore in, in, my, in my manuscript because I want to say earlier rather than original. So I don't know whether that helps. Second thing is, is besides literature, besides the arts, we might pull in an anthropology and talk about, uh, and I'm just getting the ball rolling here, myth and ritual as two sides of the same coin. And in that case, uh, if we think of some of the words that were in the write-up of this session, and I'm almost done, I think of the word pathos, just for starters, which uh, can mean that that primal passion that, let's say, Oedipus has and that Aristotle is so interested in, in the poetics. But pathos can also be, let's say, emotions, when it's just ordinary people like you and me. Pathos is emotion when, when it's about us. It's about this larger-than-life passion if it's about, let's say, Oedipus. And, and then what do we do when we go to theater or we go to drama? Well, anthropologically, drama is, is, the, is the active way of saying sacrifice, and pathos is the passive way of saying sacrifice. How's that for uh, a provocative uh, Frazier set of... Frazier still talked about in these terms? Uh, golden Bough, or is he considered not? Okay, Frazier's, uh, Frazier's Golden Bough, if you buy the paperback edition, you might as well forget about it, because all those intuitions uh, are now disputed by anthropologists. Right. If you go to the original edition and the multi-volume edition, read all the footnotes, they're still okay. <laughs> so, so it, in other words, it's the ethnographic uh, evidence that he he put together that really matters, not his myth ritual construct, which is now considered. Um, um, the form, start with form, the form of tragedy uh, is itself evolving. And it takes trage- the, the form of tragedy uh, a long time to discover, half a century at least, to discover what it might consider its ideal form. Um, and among, among the processes in that discovery is theme or subject. And, and here Aristotle might be helpful. Uh, Aristotle says that the best tragedies, or he, the preface, he says that in the beginning, tragedy, the themes of tragedies, the subjects of tragedy were arbitrary. Uh, but in time, the Athenians came to discover what they considered or what Aristotle calls the best of tragedies. And these deal with families. And at the heart of tragedy, then, is the family uh, and the terrible things that families do to each other. Uh, He says the best tragedies come from family structures where father kills son or mother kills son or son kills mother. Those are are the rudiments of tragedy at its best form. And and that is the subject, uh, the pathos focused on the family. Um, certainly goes back to uh, a whole rich array of Greek myths prior to that form. He also says, if I may add, that uh, the best plays actually have a happy ending. Good things happen (laughs) to good people, bad (laughs) things happen to bad people, which is not how we usually think about tragedy. And I think that's actually pretty important because I think there are not that many of the tragedies we have, and I know how few they yes, are. Yes. Uh, 34, something, something like that, yeah, out of depending thousands. Yeah. Uh, right. uh, very few of them have a happy ending. Right. And I think that's important that Aristotle sees it that way, because uh, here I'm supposed to say something philosophical, so <laughs> not linguistic. Um, there is a sense in which I think I could pick up your point on the sensibility of tragedy. I think there's a very major difference, in my opinion, between what happens before Plato and after Plato uh, in Greek thought. Um, and here, I am influenced by Nietzsche very much. Um, that What I would call the tragic view of life is a view that ultimately says that the world is not made for us. We happen to be in it, and it goes whichever way it goes. And we try to do things in it, and just about every time we fail. We can't control the world. We can't control our fate. And yet, 
you see in tragedy, and that's how Nietzsche takes tragedy, and that's why he thinks it's such a great work, a great genre. Uh, you see the hero who almost knows already that he's going to be destroyed at the end of the play gladly taking on the burden of doing whatever it is that uh, is his appointed task for the play or according to the original myth. So the idea is that, yeah, we can't actually change the world. Nietzsche has this wonderful little parable. He says, uh, once upon a time, uh, there was a little planet that was circling around a insignificant star at the edge of the universe. And on this planet, uh, some clever beasts evolved, and they invented knowledge. It was the most arrogant uh, invention in the history of the universe. But never mind, nature took a few more breaths, the, the, the star died, and the clever beasts perished. <laughs> that is just about the view that tragedy <laughs> has of the world. And here we are thinking that, in fact, we can get it all under control. Those who taught us that we can do that are the philosophers, especially Plato, and after him, Aristotle in the tradition, where for Plato, virtue, knowledge is virtue, and virtue is happiness. So if you know what the good thing to do is, you will do it. And once you do it, you will be happy, and the world will reward you one way or the other. Because we are harmonious. The world has this beautiful mathematical structure, and we fit in it perfectly because our souls are, sort of reflect the world. So tragedy, in a way, uh, is at least in its sensible form, sensibility form, is according to Nietzsche and to, you know, Bernard Williams, a philosopher who wrote recently about that, uh, it gets lost with the classical philosophers and a new view comes in. So it's interesting to compare the two. And can I add one other thought on these lines? Um, as you go to the Metropolitan Museum a few blocks over there, um, you wander around the Greco-Roman section. It is to walk into an astonishing experience of cultural complexity, um, predating Plato, predating the tragedians. Is one of the fascinations of Greek culture that there is a massive reservoir of creativity from the Homeric times, etc., and that surge of creativity ultimately becomes theorized. But one of the wonders of Greek civilization, to an outsider such as me, might be that there is such powerful creativity before theorization mm -hmm. of a highly technical kind kicks in. I wonder whether there's an interesting lesson, perhaps, to be learnt there of one of the wonders of Greece being the great surge of electricity before people understand how to assess the electricity. Um. Well, I can say something about that from the point of view of the brain, which is that you know, we tend to think of consciousness as uh, very important, but I think modern science is revealing, um, perhaps va validating something that Freud said, which is consciousness is really the tip of the iceberg. That he stole it from Nietzsche. Okay. <laughs> and he got it from somebody else, too. Freud so. <laughs> borrowed from that. Um, but the, you know, the machinations underlying our thought processes are really taking place at a, a very um, underlying level that doesn't necessarily percolate up into conscious awareness. I mean, we're all speaking in syntactically proper sentences and so forth, right. and we're not planning any of that. So it's not... It's not unconscious in necessarily the Freudian sense where it's an anxious thought that gets shipped down because you can't handle it, but instead that most of the mind and brain are just operating below the surface. Sometimes we can access these things pretty easily when things are in sort of a pre-conscious state. Uh, it just means that they're, they can be conscious, they're just not conscious now. But most of it is, is underneath in a way that isn't accessible. And that's also especially true of our emotions, um, that the, we come to know our emotions in many ways by observing our behavior and seeing how people react to us rather than necessarily being able to look inside our brain and see them. So that could be real, relevant to your comment about you know, the, the burst of creativity before conceptualization. Has anybody tried to do a, an fMRI of the viewers of tragedy to see if indeed Aristotle is right and that it goes through pity and fear? Uh, <laughs> fear being your specialty, right. I think it would be very interesting. As far as I know, no one has taken that on, but, but uh, it could be interesting. You know, I think you'll show that there isn't any pity and fear. Uh, in the in the in the people, no, the pity and fear in the in the, in the story. It's another. That's well, that's another issue. <laughs> well, but, but while we're on pity and fear, uh, let, let me just try something on you, and that is, if we go back again to this word pathos, and we think not of of emotions of everyday people, but uh, 
those primal passions of figures like Oedipus in, uh, in Sophocles' as Oedipus Tudanos or Pentheus in, in uh, Euripides' as Bacchic Women. Um, when you're dealing with these big uh, moments of pathos, then you really have to think not only of the human who is experiencing, the superhuman who's experiencing it, but the god who is, uh, who is at the root of the experience, and that god is Dionysus. We all think of Dionysus, we moderns, as the god of wine, but Dionysus is primarily the god of theater, and by theater, it's really the god of masks. And, and Dionysus is the only uh, divine figure who, when he is showing his face, is showing a mask. His face is the mask. Why am I saying that? It's because the word prosopon, which means face, it also means mask, and that's thanks to Dionysus, the god of theater. But even better, prosopon, if I can go back to my, um, my bread and butter linguistics, prosopon is also a person. And by person, now I mean first, second, third persons. Uh, and we all think that that's very boring. That's the way we learn languages, uh, and that's how we, we study verbs and pronouns. But, but actually, as uh, Emil Bambaniste showed in a beautiful article in 1958, which is in the Journal of uh, Normal Psychology and Pathological Society, Journal de la Psychologie Normale et Pathologique, 1958, as I say, and he, he has an article on subjectivity and language where he says that basically for grammarians like him and for like me, it's the first person who is the person of subjectivity because that person owns the discourse while that person is talking. Uh, but that person is always on the lookout for a second person to have a dialogue with. Okay, and then and then the third person is what in Greek vase paintings is the profile. You know, uh, in Greek vase paintings, if the character isn't making contact with you, it's a profile. When it's a frontal view, then it's making contact with you and making dialogue, just as a mask is making dialogue. So, to go back to this formula, uh, Dionysus as the god of theater, the god of masks, is looking for a dialogic partner who is the you. And as Roman Jakobson showed, uh, this you and this I, uh, these are shifters. Uh, uh, they're embrayeurs, because um, when I'm saying I, in, in this historical contingency, I know what I'm talking about. But if Francis says I, then I have to reverse who I and you are. They shift. And it's Dionysus who controls that shifting from uh, who the I is and who the you is. Interestingly, isn't there a neurological condition called prosopagnosia? The inability to recognize. I'm not pronouncing. Yeah, faces, right. You made prosopagnosia. Nice. Yeah. Where, where um, as, as it says, um, I remember your name, but I can't place your face. That's right. <laughs> Dionysus joke, joke, joke. <laughs> <laughs> is more than, also, apart from theater, he's also the god of regeneration and of lack of measure, yes, right, of excess. Yes, yes. And I think that becomes very important, at least in Nietzsche's way of understanding tragedy, because for Nietzsche, tragedy is a combination of two fundamental tendencies that he finds in all human beings, he claims, uh, the Apollonian and the Dionysian, associated with the two gods. Apollo is the god of measure, the god of light, the god of plastic arts, where everything is clearly outlined, whereas Dionysus, regeneration, excess, is the breakdown, the breakdown of all distinction and the sense that we all belong to some larger group, almost like a mob, whether uh, in the sense, not, not that we do necessarily bad things, but in the sense that one loses one's individual identity and just becomes an element in, in the mob. And tragedy, he sees, as the combination of those two, where the Dionysian element, which is a chorus for him, represents the, this uncaring world that I was talking about before that goes on its own way and is not individual. There are many members in the chorus, whereas what happens on the stage, the plot with individual heroes and characters, is the Apollonian part. And what happens, according to Nietzsche, it's a crazy view, but extraordinarily interesting, is that he thinks that what happens on the stage is a vision of the chorus. So that in a way, the stage doesn't exist in its own right. 
And what happens is that the chorus remains there after the end of the action, after the hero, according to Nietzsche, has been destroyed, and enjoys the spectacle. Yeah. So yeah. the idea, Nietzsche's idea, is that that's what the world is like, too. The world is this careless, unstructured whole that every now and then sp- spews forth a culture. <laughs> yes, Why? I- Sorry? If, if this uh, Dionysus is of excess, uh, he's also, um, and he, he's the one who leads to the dismemberment of the hero. Exactly. Um, he himself, he, I mean, dismembered. He, he himself experiencing dismemberment. Uh, he also has a locale, and his locale is in the mountains. It's outside right. the city. And what, and what the theater does is to bring that larger force, that mountain presence, uh, into the city and expose it to the structures of the That's city, right. the city trying to maintain order, distinction, coherence, rationality, and the greatness of the Athenian spirit is to bring that larger force and and see its devastating effect upon the structures of of community, polity, rationality, coherence, even wholeness itself. Right. right. Do you think that? To think about the ancient world is to think about a world that we simply cannot recognize. Um, Think of the mortality rates in giving birth. Um, Mm. If you had pneumonia in antiquity, you're dead. Um, There are no formalized welfare systems, I take it. It is a slave society. Um, I take it that life is unthinkable in comparison with modern life. Um, I wonder the extent to which the differences in our general lifestyles must condition the way in which we think about tragedy. We see tragedy on Broadway. It must be an entirely different experience to conceptualize tragedy and to think about it. Does anyone have a view on the sheer gulf of difference? What are we seeing when we see a Sophoclean play? How can it begin to approximate the experience of witnessing ancient tragedy in Athens in the 5th century? Just for starters, uh, theater in the ancient world is a civic ob- obligation. If you say, oh, I, c- I can't afford to go to theater, state theater, well, th- then the state will pay you. And, uh, and I- if, if we believe Plato's numbers, uh, uh, 30,000 people attend Athenian state theater. And, uh, and the uh, figures like Sophocles or Aeschylus or even, even Euripides are state poets. And, um, and, and when we talk about uh, people coming together, let's say 30,000 of them, and, and participating, uh, in the pathos and staying a whole day and staying a whole day, day and, and, four and, plays each and, time. and here are these larger than life characters who are going through their passions let's say in Christian terms you'd call it the passion mm-hmm. uh, and, and, and they take their emotions uh, and each one of us all 30,000 of us have have various pathos emotions, whether it's fear or or pity, or and, and Alexander and I and Steve can have fun with whether those are the proper emotions to start with. But anyway, whatever emotions we bring in, um, now let's come, let's come to the word that was used in the description of this meeting, uh, which is catharsis or catharsis. And so, uh, from a ritual point of view, it's a, it's a purging of one's own emotions. From a medical point of view, it's, um, I guess it's also a purging, you <laughs> call it. Uh, or maybe in the ritual sense, we should call it purification yes. rather than yeah. purging. Uh, but, but I don't think Aristotle would have worried about, oh, is this medical? Oh, is this ritual? It's, it's just uh, how a, a fourth century personality uh, thinks of catharsis. But there it is. It's, it's the collective um, bringing together of emotions into one place. And as Steve said, um, th- that's the beauty of these uh, these uh, these state festivals is that uh, everything comes together at one point in the city center, and then things happen. And um, even when we say, "Oh, this is the this is um, the song of the goat," well, more specifically, it's competitive singing, where the first prize is a sacrificial goat. And, and there are other kinds of competitive singing, for example, early forms of epic, where the first prize is a sacrificial lamb. And so that's Arnoldia rather than Tragoldia. But uh, the important thing is, and Alexander can tell us 
uh, all about this because the lens of Nietzsche uh, sees it so mm -hmm. clearly. It's an agon. It's a coming together, which is um, the occasion for competition, for an ordeal, um, and uh, for, let's just say, um, a, um, a, a purging of everything that yeah, and sometimes they purge themselves of their food in the sense of throwing it at the actors when they didn't like <laughs> well, yes. them. You know, because they had to bring, they, they were there for many, many hours each day, uh, and it was hot. It was in daytime, right, because there are no electrical lights or anything like that. So people would bring food, and we know there are uh, testimonies about getting actors, kicking actors <laughs> off the stage, or Alcibiades not liking whom they gave the prize to, or no, I think he actually took an actor and threw him out of the, of the, of the theater, whatever. I'd like to just give another, ask, another way of looking at tragedy, though. If you, let's do a thought experiment. Suppose that you had never heard of Greek tragedy, and I came to you, and you know everything else, but not Greek tragedy, and I said to you, uh, you know, there's this amazing show tonight. Um, it's about this guy who is, uh, you know, the... Uh, sort of village elder in some place or a city or whatever, mayor, king, whatever, you know. And things are going badly in town, and he needs to find out why, why they're... Uh, and uh, so he has all kinds of fights where people he sends there, he, he thinks that everything's being done to unseat him, that all the bad things that happen in town are due to various plots and all that. Well, then it turns out that he finds out he's the one. Not only is he the one who is responsible for it, but the reason that he's the one is that he killed his father and he married his mother with whom he has children who are also his sisters and sons and uh, brothers. And when he finds out, he tears his eyes out and comes on stage with all the blood rushing down And after his mother has hanged herself. And, uh, and there it is. I mean, is that HBO or is it <laughs> Oedipus or is it Sophocles? Uh, if you describe the plays at that level, they are gory, hoary uh, sort of entertainments of the sort that we today would think are the things that, you know, we are not really, we don't admit that we see them unless they are artsy, like The Godfather or whatever. But the stories are very, very uh, sort of vulgar on that level. Now, when we go to the theater, we dress up, right? And we don't cough and we don't eat candy and the phones have to be taken off or whatever. For us, it's a, it's a rather sacred occasion in a way. It was sacred for them too, but the attitude was completely different. And what level it was that they actually uh, interacted with, at what level they inter the audience interacted with the place is something I think we know very little about. Did they see it as we see it, as this sort of allegory of human fate or uh, something that goes into primal passions or whatever? Or did they see it as this bloody good story, you know? Lots of murders, lots of sex, lots of everything that you like in theater, which is why, of course, Plato hated it. And he thought nobody should have it. You know, so, it's, and think of the poetics. The poetics is the, the greatest work of literary criticism, supposedly. What does the poetics, Aristotle's poetics, tell us? He says, well, you know, there are those plays and this and that and the other. And you know, they can't be too long or too short. Uh, it's better, the plays are better if things change. <laughs> so, so from good you go to bad and from bad to good and all that. And uh, you have to get a good story. If you don't have a good story, the play is going nowhere. Uh, <laughs> The rest you can, you can deal with one way or the other. And the best ones actually have you know, happy endings. It's very elementary stuff, what he's saying there. Deep as the, 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 the essay or the book may also be. It says some very simple things. It's the first one ever to say them. And that's extremely important. It doesn't have to be deeper than that. But even though it's very elementary, if, if, you, uh, if you go to, to movies, as I do, um, and, and maybe it's my age, but I'm disappointed in 95% of whatever I see, it's because I don't see a good plot character interface. Mm -hmm. And good old Mr. A already says, that. well, uh, you're not going to have good character if you don't have good plot. Plot drives the character. And if the character sort of slips away in the development of plot, then it's all the, over. It falls apart. And, right. and, um, and, and so maybe I'm being too Aristotelian, but I, I think of, for example, a, a very bad film in the, uh, 15 years ago called Heathers, which, had, oh, which was yeah, really yeah, great yeah, for the first uh, two thirds. Yeah. And then it fell apart because obviously. Winona Ryder was it? Winona, Winona Ryder was, yeah. was uh, the non Heather, yes. <laughs> 
Um, well, I would uh, go back to what Harris. <laughs> I haven't seen Heather. If I have, I don't remember it. Heather's. There are three of them. There are oh, three there are bad Heather's. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I suspect Aristotle was not alone in identifying what makes for good tragedy, and it's the components you said, but it is also, as he says, those components in the most gruesome of environments. Right. And so I was, forgot and, about yeah, that. That's an essential <laughs> sex part. Sex and violence sex, is really important. Sex and violence, and sex and violence of the most intimate in the Freudian romance. Sex and violence between mother, father, and son. That's where the sex right. and violence is at its most uh, intense, and that's where tragedy is at its most effectiveness. I think that that component is extremely important. Uh, t- for us to remember that. And I doubt if Aristotle was alone in having that sensibility. A tragedy was nothing like our experience with theater. Uh, first of all, being in the daylight was very important in the sense that you it was a community experience. Mm-hmm. You were, you're not, it's not a private experience. It's the opposite you're of a movie. You're not pretending you're alone. You're not alone. Right. You're not in your own fantasy. It's you're in civic. A com- <laughs> it's civic. Yeah. And, and, it's, and it's more like a football game than it is like a theater because That's there exactly. are no armrests. And you're touching everyone. And so what goes, th- what goes through you is going through your neighbors. It's one body of audience as having a, com- having a communal experience. It's nothing like the theater, and mostly it's not like the, our theater, is that it only was once a year, and the whole community was preparing for nine months. The children were in the theater. The children were acting in it, and they were preparing for it, and the whole community was anticipating it, and they only saw it once. Well, you didn't have a rerun. You, uh, you didn't have to. Uh, you couldn't come. The you know. I don't think I'd like to go Saturday night because I'm I'm have a dinner date with Greg. I want to. I, I you know. That's it. Uh, vastly different expectation on the part of the audience and anticipation, intensification. Totally different. If I can raise the point about the Aristotelian catharsis business, can I ask you, Joe? Uh, from a, the modern viewpoint of assessing emotion, capacity, and function, is the Aristotelian idea of a purging catharsis hopelessly, as it were, off the pace? Or how does it strike a modern researcher? Um, well, you know, it's a lot of what I do is based on research on memory and memory of danger and fear uh, and emotion, negative emotion, and. Once you have those memories, uh, they can be devastating. Uh, for example, someone with PTSD who has recurring memories of trauma. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there are different ways of, of viewing this. One is that you need to uh, relive the trauma and, and deal with it, I guess, maybe in a cathartic kind of sense. Uh, but that often makes it worse if you have a really serious, uh, uh, debilitating kind of tragic memory. Um, the other possibility is to gradually try to weaken it uh, through various ways. Now, um, one of the ways you can do this is by uh, altering the memory itself. And the, uh, that's one of the topics I wanted to bring up, which is the role of memory in tragedy and whether these were like Homer passed on by word of mouth or were they somehow encoded in a more Don't formal worry. way. They were written, right, or is uh, the place? Yeah. I, I, I'm dying to, to bring up a German word, uh, which is Nachträglichkeit, <laughs> which, uh, which Freud uh, would use for, I, I guess it's usually translated in scientific English as, as a supplement, but what, what he's driving at is, is something that is not only a supplement, but a resentment. And if you have, let's say, a series of events, A through Z, but when you get to that very dangerous, let's say, letter D, uh, there's a substitution of, of D, and you have D1, D2, D3 instead of D. That's not And uh, that kind of, um, of, of screen memory, Dekerinerung, um, is, is, is something that you actually see alive and well in, 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 in the plots of tragedy where, where um, somebody's blocking something. Oedipus would be exhibit A. He's blocking and blocking and blocking until uh, he can't block anymore. So, is that helpful? Uh, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'll just continue a little bit on, on yeah. the, some of the efforts we're doing to remove memories because... Um, yeah. 
Um, I don't know if it's relevant, but I'm not yes, sure what else to tell you about. <laughs> it's a free for all. So the, um, when we do this research on rats, and in rats what we can do is make a rat afraid of something and then uh, prevent the rat from restoring the memory, and when that happens, the memory is no longer accessible. So each time you use a memory, it becomes a new memory because you change it as you take it out and you have to put it back in and restore it. And each time you store it, it goes through a period of vulnerability where it can be altered at that moment, either made stronger or weaker. And the, um, there are things we can do in rats to weaken the memory and therefore make the rat no longer remember that, that particular event. Now, this is also being used in studies of patients with post-traumatic stress disorder to weaken their emotional memories without necessarily altering their cognitive memory of the situation. With addicts, too, right? And with addicts, yes. So you can, again, this is based on rat research where uh, a rat that's addicted to cocaine, you can give the rat a, a retrieval cue or a relapse cue that would normally make him... Uh, take the drug again, but if you block the restorage of that memory of the relapse cue, when he's exposed to that cue in the future, he no longer relapses. Mm-hmm. So, um, Can I just that's ask, just, yeah. if it's post-traumatic stress disorder, is there a timeline, an average timeline, in which you can reverse the memory or obliterate the memory? Um, Theoretically, no. So the... Um, when th- there are things you can do immediately after the trauma to try and ameliorate the development of the memory. And the problem is that you never quite get to people at the right time. Mm-hmm. Um, so one of the advances that this research is uh, generating is the possibility that you could have a traumatic memory for a lifetime. And simply by retrieving it and blocking the restorage, it's no longer effective. So here's a real life example of, of how this works, which is someone witnesses a crime, they testify at the scene, give the, t- give the testimony to the police. Um, Then they go to court, and rather than talking about what they saw on the day of the crime, they talk about what they read in the newspaper, because that information had been incorporated into the memory, and it's now a new memory, which the person believes is the actual memory. Mm. Um, And somehow this must be relevant. So so that's the screen (laughs) memory. (laughs) Well, can we run with that one to see in tragedy? I'm I'm sorry. Uh, um, how, How does hearing somebody else's story help a person suffering from a traumatic memory hearing in other words not remembering your own story right. but 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 having that distance through somebody else's story so i don't know i can't give you an exact answer but um, one thing i can tell you is that when a person is in an emotional state the brain becomes um, synchronized so that you have an organismic level response the brain and body are um, monopolized by the emotion the emotion takes over and dominates everything that's going on. So if you're in a situation of danger, you have to focus all of your resources on that situation. If you're in pursuit of a mate, you have to, have to devote your resources to that. If you're hungry, you have to devote, devote your resources to that. So the brain gets synchronized and monopolized by these emotions. And if two people are in a similar situation, uh, each has a synchronized and monopolized brain, which then becomes a source of synchronization and monopolization to the other person. Mm-hmm. So Transfer? Right, through just social interaction, uh, because you're going to feed off of that energy that that person is giving out, and it's going to affect your brain as well. So a crowd watching tragedy is going to also be doing this. And there's something called mirror neurons that many of you have probably heard of, where the brain is, has there are supposedly two kinds. One is when you watch, watch someone uh, perform a motor response, your brain kind of imitates that um, as if you were doing it yourself. But the other is an emotional kind of mirror neuron, which is emulating the emotion of the other person. So in a, tragi- in a, a tragedy, in a play, um, you can imagine that the emotion being created on stage is synchronizing the activity of all these people, which are synchronizing each other as well, uh, and their mirror neurons are capturing the emotion, spreading it to one another, and that's why you have such a powerful uh, situation. I mean, of course, in the case of Philip Thades, who the center is named after, he couldn't, on his own, get rid of the memory, mm. the repudiation. No, he's stuck. But is there God, another... God had to come in. Yes. Uh, is there another aspect of memory function here as well? That um, First of all, an audience knows the Oedipus story before it goes to the theatre in the myth cycle. 
there is, in that sense, memory in terms of the knowing the myth. And secondly, one writer might allude to another, activating another's play using elusive literary memory. I wonder if that might be a very interesting function of the tragic experience. Um, well, you certainly have a very educated audience, especially because the family of plots, because they're all plots about families, do it. The family of plots <laughs> not very large. Right? Uh, right. It's funny. There are very few plays, right? And in fact, uh, Aristotle mentions only one play that has only fictional characters. It's as if it's a great, uh, a great uh, innovation or uh, very unusual. But what play is it? It's a play by Agathon, I think it's called Antheon, maybe, yeah, yeah. something like that. Yeah, Agathon, who's a character in Plato's Symposium, actually, uh, is one of the playwrights. But speaking of playwrights, another very major difference, I think, between the tragic plays and contemporary theater in general is that, as Greg said, he goes to movies, 95% of them are bad. Well, I am convinced that 90% of the Greek Athenian tragedies that were written were bad. We don't have 95%? them. 98. I think it's, it's, a steady, it's a steady percentage, right? 2% is always good. The rest of it is bad. We have, as I said, 34 plays. These three people between them wrote close over 100, as far as we know, each, right? So that's 300 plays from those three people of which we have 11% or something like that. And there were hundreds of playwrights. Because tragedy was produced in Athens for at least 100 years before they started allowing plays to be rerun, right. Right? except for Aeschylus, because he was so important. Right. Right? So it was in the 4th century that they started allowing plays to be produced again. So it's quite clear to me that there were many bad ones. Why do we have the ones we have? We have them partly because they were copied a lot. There are more copies of them. Right? Yeah. I mean, but, but you know what? Okay. Let's grant you that um, a lot of tragedies were bad, uh, but uh, if, if we follow Aristotle and treat the Iliad and the Odyssey as, as, as really good tragedies, and actually they do follow the rules of tragedy, and I've worried about this, hmm. why are the Iliad and the Odyssey so tragic? And the more I got into it, the more I realized that in the 5th century, uh, this is the sum total of a lot of years of work. In the 5th century, um, Iliad and the Odyssey came to life only in performance in democratic Athens. And just as with uh, the city Dionysia, uh, Iliad and the Odyssey would be, for, be performed once every four years at the great festival of Our Lady of Athens in August. And, uh, and if we believe Plato's Ion, okay, 20,000 people attended, and it was again a civic event. And if I could just conjure one moment, there's one point where Plato Socrates is interviewing one of these superstar performers of this epic called Ion, meaning Mr. Ionian. More on that some other time. And, and uh, Socr Plato Socrates says, how does it feel when you're standing up there at that elevation and you see uh, 20,000 pairs of eyes uh, weeping when Hector says goodbye to Andromache in Rhapsody 6? What does that make you feel like? What does it make you feel like when uh, just the way you recite it, uh, uh, when, when Achilles lunges after Hector in Rhapsody 22 of the Iliad, that 20,000 people have their hair stand on end? And he says, essentially, I'm laughing all the way to the bank, yeah. but, <laughs> but, but that's not fair. Play, Plato is not fair to Rhapsodes. <laughs> but can we extend the experience in another dimension as well? You know, when you go to see an Oedipus or when you go and see the Bacchae, um, to the modern eye, my students at Columbia all read these plays as part of general education, and they zone in immediately on the figure of Oedipus or the figure of Pentheus. And I have to spend a lot of time easing them away from that to think about the social function of an Oedipus. For example, um, a play about Mr. Rationality. The modern way is knowledge. Oedipus is Superman. He can solve these puzzles yeah. and can really solve the state. Right. And he makes the dreadful mistake, though, of therefore throwing out traditional piety and belief in the oracle. To what extent is the Oedipus not about Oedipus, but about modernity and the collision and interaction between a modern rationalizing scientific instinct and a traditional religionizing instinct? Do we concentrate too much on the individuals and not enough on the social importance and social intelligence of the dramas? 
I just love that. I mean, what you just said, yeah, Gareth, reminds good. me of um, an essay by the late Bernard Knox, who, uh, who, um, who said in the 50s that, uh, that essentially Oedipus talks like a 5th century radical Democrat. And, and thinks like one and, and has that real rational streak. And I'm going to get to the bottom of this in a fifth century Athenian way, and then look what happens. Yeah, it's, it's partly what I was saying before in connection with Nietzsche that the, the tragic sensibility is now perceiving its own dangers, right? And uh, it's being worked out in, in, in Sophocles. In Aeschylus, you don't have as much of that. In Aeschylus, if anything, you have Athenian democracy. <laughs> Things are getting better. You know? Better and better. <laughs> so all the time. No wonder Pericles paid people's uh, <laughs> yes. fair, fair, you know, tickets. Yes. You know? This century is a, is a wonderful moment of... Uh, of myth is still alive. Yeah. Myth is still yeah. alive. Yeah. And yet it's also the beginnings with Socrates and others of his ilk and the, with the attention to rhetoric especially, um, an age of increasing rationality. And the theater is, is a collision of this uh, understanding experience through these mythic stories and exposing them to all of the intellectual energy of, of the 5th century Athens, mm -hmm. which is moving towards rationalization, um, intellectualizing, and the, the theater contains that explosion. It's a wonderful expression of the uh, intellectual tumult of the 5th century. Can we also see a problem in the term tragic? Um, uh, I had a wonderful time with Aeschylus's Oresteia trilogy, um, reading it with my students, but my students began to laugh at one point in the Coeferoi because of a very funny scene that's played out. Um, we tend to think of tragedy as being tragic, but then there are disconcerting shafts of humour. And then there's comedy, which can have a very tragic component as well. Um, is there a certain narrowness to thinking of tragedy in isolation from the other flourishing literary forms, comedy, symposiastic poetry, etc.? And do they merge and morph and in collide with each other far more than the modern student reading Greek tragedy would normally imagine? Yes. <laughs> so, so, good. Totally agree. Totally agree. Yeah. <laughs> And then they say intellectuals don't give straight answers. <laughs> I wanted to come back to the, the question of post-traumatic stress. And as, as Aristotle has made so famous, that tragedy, the, the genre of tragedy plays some part in that. And um, you might say, it's a curiosity to me, and maybe um, others here can, can illuminate me, but the... We don't see very clearly evidence of post-traumatic stress in the literature of the ancient world or the rituals of the ancient world. Maybe it's there in ways, evidence of, of the Athenians sub, being subjected to post-traumatic stress. You might think that they were, would be subjected to it in an intense way because the citizen from the age of 18 to 60 fought a war for two-thirds of the year every year of his life. They were always, the Athenian citizens were always at war. And they would come back every year to the house uh, from being on campaign. Uh, you would think that there might be more evidence of the population being subject to the kinds of things that we see now. Maybe, maybe uh, post-traumatic stress is not a condition of the ancient warrior. It's an interesting question. Um, or if it is, how, uh, how is it expressed? And how might tragedy be a way of, of healing or being a process of healing for such a state? Well, even in modern times, it wasn't really recognized until World War I as shell shock. Yeah. And even that, you know, only after the fact, was reinterpreted as PTSD. So it's a relatively modern concept. And... Um, um, you know, it just may not have been something they talked about in a way that made sense to us. Uh, it might have been. It would have burst out somehow. It would have exploded onto the same, you would think, somehow. Yeah. Well, do we know if it's a function of the... Well, I'm sure it's a function of the severity of the, of the event, but also is the function of the rarity of it? In other words, if you're fighting every year, mm. 
you won't find war as traumatic as if you do it once and you have you know, the whole of German industry bombing well, the, you. The, the fact is that in any sort of situation, battlefield and automobile accident, plane accident and so forth, uh, it's not the severity of the situation but the individual that interacts with that. So only a small proportion of people, roughly 20 to 30 percent, develop any sort of symptoms uh, that, that persist. So uh, perhaps the, they had a better way of selecting soldiers before battle. No, no. Every, was, Everyone. The, every the citizen. whole citizen body. Yeah. Um, Aeschylus, of course, fought at Marathon. Yes. Well, isn't there a, a, a tradition that the Battle of Salamis... Right. Battle of Salamis, yeah. Uh, Sophocles... Sophocles fought, comes of age. Right, and Euripides is born. Euripides is born. born. Yeah. All three yeah. of them yeah. are connected with 480, it. 480, yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, but there's a genetic component to this. It's, it's conceivable that this sort of increased over time in some way. That's, and so well, that's more... Yeah. Of what? Of a hardening. Or, uh, uh, Sorry? A, a, a kind of defense mechanism. Yeah. Uh, well, it could have, for whatever reason, been selected through human evolution in some way to become more prominent uh, in the gene pool. Mm. Um, Post-traumatic becomes more prominent? Right. Maybe. Uh, possibly. possibly. Accidentally. Not uh-huh. necessarily because it has survival value, but because yeah. of it's associated with something else, then it just becomes more Spandle. prevalent. <laughs> <laughs> one, one thing about uh, uh, characters that are represented in tragedy or in epic is that they're always larger than life. I don't know whether this is useful to bring up. And I mean so much larger than life that that's why uh, when you talk about their pathos, as I tried to suggest earlier, it's a passion that is similar to the way Christians use the word passion with reference to one larger-than-life sufferer. And uh, and so when 30,000 people come to have their uh, their emotions purged, and that's called the emotion pathos, uh, this larger-than-life character who has that larger-than-life pathos is... Uh, is is really like a magnet. Now I'm using Focusing. the word magnet yeah, yeah. because because uh, it, the magnetic force can either attract or repel. And when Aristotle has the has the formula uh, of um, pity and terror, uh, well, pity is the is the is the reaching out to the sufferer, uh, uh, the attraction to uh, the compassion. suffering, a uh, compassion. Yeah. And, and think of the word compassion, which yes. is sharing in the passion, whereas um, whereas terror is shrinking back, and, and it's the it's the opposite magnetic force, where where ooh, I don't want this to happen to me, and uh, and it's that dynamic that uh, that plays out when you when you take your your emotions, your own emotions, to theater. About being greater than life, I, here I, I'm thinking of Nietzsche again, who thinks that Aeschylean and Sophoclean heroes are larger than life, yeah. but Euripidean characters right. are not. Right. He says, Euripides brought the spectator on the stage. Those yes. are people just like us. Yeah. Uh, the, who are you, who have views, who yeah. engage in kind of rhetorical contests yeah. with one another. Uh, you have the gods coming in and telling you what's going to happen. And there's always a reason. I mean, you know, the goddess is mad because Hippolytus adores the other goddess, so she creates this terrible situation. Whereas in Sophocles and um, Aeschylus, you don't have explanations of that sort. Right? And, and, and it just what, happens to them. And what Alexander just says could be a, a way of saying that uh, as you witness the evolution of tragedy uh, and in the 5th century and, and then moving into the 4th century, and Euripides is, let's say, the decadent phase right. in, in Nietzsche's terminology. Yeah. You can also say, again... Except Tom, for the Bacchae. So that's where he, well, he, he apologizes to the god for that. Well, okay, yeah. but even with the Bacchae, uh, the, the Bacchic women, which is, which is uh, arguably his last, uh, his last tragedy... Uh, his swan song, uh, even there, um, th- there's just so much self-reference that mm-hmm. you could say it's like, uh, you know, the saying, bring Christ back to Christmas, and there used to be a saying, well, what does this have to do with Dionysus? So Euripides, who's one of the people who kills the ritual element, then really brings it back in a vengeance, like putting Christ back into Christmas. Mm-hmm. 
and uh, and putting uh, putting Dionysus back into the city Dionysia because most tragedies have nothing to do with Dionysus, and that's what the saying is. So it's it's been said that when a, a form of art is losing its punch or getting bleached, it tries to call attention to itself yeah. mm -hmm. even more and more and more. And, and that you could say that, that it's not so much that Euripides is saying, I'm sorry, but, uh, but that this really is the swan song. It has not run only, its course. It's run its course, and it's the swan song not only of Euripides, but of tragedy itself. Well, it's a question I was thinking about yeah. all of you guys you know, being together here. Is tragedy possible, kind of, uh, the, un the understanding of what you're talking about in sort of the age of therapeutic intervention? Uh, there was a, there, Roz Chast, who's a cartoonist for The New Yorker, yes. I think a number of years ago did a parody of what would have happened if very, you know, uh, well, she used Samuel Beckett. A number of people had been in therapy. You know, he was in therapy, <laughs> actually. Uh, but work. I mean, a number of, if, you had taken, if you had taken <laughs> Sophocles and put him in psychoanalysis, I mean, or if, if you had yes. taken his characters and put them in psychoanalysis, yes. then they wouldn't have had these life lives, you know. Yes. Uh, yes. In other words, are we, are, is, is our understanding of tragedy somehow, uh, you know, being sabotaged by the kind of self-consciousness we would, would, would regard events of the same nature? May I try something? Which please, is, please. This is Second City comedy yeah. and, and and I don't know how many of you have seen on YouTube yeah. a whole series where uh, uh, Shakespearean uh, female characters who are on the verge of suicide or other kinds of self-destruction that they could be saved if they had a sassy gay friend <laughs> and, and and Ophelia is a good one and 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 uh, Desdemona is another good one <laughs> Juliet is a good one and and I, I, I tried this with ancient Greek tragedy doesn't work <laughs> <laughs> that's because there were no gays there <laughs> I don't know about a hundred years I don't know about <laughs> no they, they were pederasts <laughs> Uh, but but that, that's a very good question. And uh, in a way, if I don't take off my Plato hat and put the Nietzsche hat on, uh, <laughs> it's very difficult to have tragedy today because part of our own way of looking at the world is sort of influenced by the Platonic Aristotelian philosophical view that says that the world is finally understandable, that you know we can actually get it. And once you have that view, it becomes difficult to have tragic situations, if by tragic situations we mean where despite our best efforts, the world is going to smash us anyway. Uh, that would be very difficult. I'm, I'm, look, I mean, you know, Willie Loman may be kind of a tragic character and all that sort of thing, but you, you don't have the larger than life. I think that's very difficult that's, to do anymore. And, now, and, yeah, and I think what Alexander said about Euripides killing the larger than life figures is absolutely uh, hitting the nail on the head. And there's something else very interesting about the Bacchic women, uh, Greg. Uh, it's, the on, it's the only play where Euripides leaves it open, why did the bad things happen? Towards yeah. the end of the play, Cadmus, who actually has been with Dionysus as opposed to his grandson Pentheus, who tries to stop him from entering uh, Greece uh, and gets destroyed by his own mother, uh, Dionysus tells Cadmus, you're going to become a snake and all kinds of terrible things are going to And he says, Dionysus, we beg you, we, that was our error. We, 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 uh, had a, uh, we, we did wrong. And he just says, that's how my father Zeus arranged everything from the beginning of time or something like that. That's part of the what? larger than life is that the human beings are finally small in these tragedies in the, in the, in the, in the great scope of the divine. And, and if you don't have, I, without that, um, modern dramas tend to, to cut off that larger frame. And I think you lose... Uh, the um, seeing the human effort in spite of the human limit you see both in tragedy the human limit is very dramatic right. mm -hmm. as well as the human effort and if modern theater looks at the human effort without exposing so much the smallness of man I think you lose something and are we also saying that um, tragedy is one part of the department of philosophy that was Athenian culture Mm. Um, <laughs> nice. Literature is philosophy fundamentally, um, broaching such obvious questions as why do bad things happen to good people, for example? Um, 
I just wonder whether we're so used to the modern notion of the philosophy department as a place where the big questions are debated and thought about. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think one needs to be honest. <laughs> but, but I find fascinating how Euripides, we haven't talked about the art of these people, actually, right. and their verbal function. Um, that's another area altogether. Or the gender issues, how enlightened an Aeschylus is about gender relations yeah. before we t talk about the philosophical angle of these writers. And no. Would it be all right to turn the tables around and for the Hellenist to gang up on the Romanist? Uh, here's Gareth, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's Gareth who, who is a philosopher and who's an expert in Seneca. Well, uh, what, about, uh, mm. what about Roman tragedy? Well, it's fragmentary. Not much survives. So, um, it is a very interesting thing. I'd just like to be very brief in suggesting two things. Um, I'm very interested by the collective emotional response to Greek tragedy. Um, to the Roman eye, from what we can tell, um, we have such few examples of tragedy actually surviving. I wonder if therapeutic value in the Roman world becomes privatized and individual. If there are 30,000 people watching a performance, while, of course, crowds did assemble at Rome, uh, after the Hellenistic age, the rise of therapeutic philosophies at Rome tend to be baggage for the individual to carry. Um, and I'm interested in the privatization <coughs> of therapeutic work in that respect. Nice. The second thing that draws my eye, um, and many people have been very fortunate to go to Rome to see the Colosseum. One of the most wondrous things about the Colosseum is not, in fact, the vertical structures, but what is below yeah. ground, where um, the animals were kept and where the slaves were kept and where tragic scenes from Euripides' Bacchae were very happily played out in the theatre in real time with real victims. A wonderful staging. And um, Seneca, uh, well, a, a staging. Yeah, um, yeah. And writers such as those I'm interested in, such as Seneca, are famous for reflecting the Roman cultural contemporary situation of adding the grotesquely vivid descriptions of blindings and thuggery, um, uh, all as part of an interest in sensationalism. And I wonder if this really does put an interesting um, finger on the changing pulse from Greece to Rome, the rise of a concentrated, extraordinarily privileged and wealthy indulgence in sensationalist drama. That's precisely what nice. you don't have nice. in tragedy, in Greek tragedy. Uh, no, no one was probably killed. There's no violence on stage. It's all through language. Except one suicide. It's, well, there's... The, the, yeah, we can argue about whether uh, that happened or not. Well, but, it happens yeah. behind the bush anyway, uh, so... Well, yeah. There, well, <laughs> if it happens. There is... There are... There are uh, and Avadni and the suppliant women jumps to her death, and Ajax does commit suicide, whether on stage or not. But it was the norm that... Uh, the great horrors of tragedy in the 5th century theater were described through language and not visual. Uh, the visualization is a, brings a, changes that enormously, and, and it, it changes us to a different, very different kind of culture than when you're describing. But what's fascinating, if, if the visualization comes along with real killings, it, what it shows is that the visual, unless you have incredible sound, I mean, uh, visual effects as we have today in movies, it's not that convincing. I mean, what do you do? You put ketchup on people, you know, or, you know, and you paint their face or whatever it is. But if the uh, messenger comes in and describes exactly what Oedipus did, and all, it's much more powerful. So that's that's a necessity of the of the, of the technological state of the genre that makes it that way. In fact, it is tr absolutely fantastic. I agree it is, with you. you it know. is. Much more can be said with language that's, that's right. than can be done with a camera, I think. And Sam Peppenpaul compared to uh, <laughs> what we have in, in, tra in Greek tragedy for, for the, or in Homer. Can for I the, it, it say something very interesting that occurred to me many years ago, actually? Uh, there's this movie by Jules Dassin called The Dream of Passion, terrible mm -hmm. title, but it's really the story of Medea done over again. There was, it's a real story. An American serviceman who was in Athens with the American base there killed uh, the, the wife of an American serviceman, killed um, the, their children because he was having an affair, which is exactly what Medea did. And the film is about an actress who's trying to produce Medea, can't understand how a woman could possibly kill her children. So she goes to jail and talks to this woman to find out how one can do something yeah. like that. And in the process, it's Melina Mercuri and Ellen Burstyn. And in the process, they reenact the murder of the children. 
And after my wife and I saw this, we realized we hadn't really seen it. We had very few uh, shots of seeing it. Seeing the so killing. Seeing the killing, but yeah. we thought we had. Uh, 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 and when uh, you actually see, you've seen it's it in your like mind. Psycho, for example. Remember in Psycho, the scene in the shower. You see very little of the actual killing, yeah. but you think you've yeah, seen yeah, it. Yeah, and I think yeah. the same thing happens yeah. with a very strong, artful description yeah. of it as well. You know, it's very powerful. Right. But you can't cut scenes in the theater the way that you can do in, in, the, in film. So, you know, it's not going to be nearly as convincing. Well, you think of H.G. Wells. Um, uh, Orson Wells is um, War of the Worlds. War of the world. uh, mm-hmm. And the, did that not have a traumatic effect? Um, Huge. It caused, it caused riots. Uh, yes. It physical thought it was happening. But that's because they pretended it was a report, too. Oh. You see, he pretended that he was just reporting. Yeah, yeah, right. Not that he was reading a book, <laughs> you know, which was very clever. But, yeah. Uh, are there other um, mental, contemporary mental disorders that are represented in the ancient world that uh, you brought up? Whether P- PTSD was prevalent? Oh, well, um, madness. Sorry. Madness. But in, in say depression, a anxiety, sense. manic uh, depression. Yeah. Yeah. Um, manic depression. Uh-huh. Well, there's a play even called Hercules. Mad. Mad, yeah, well, mad, yeah, yeah. Ma- mad and Hercules. Oh. And the personification of Magnus Lusa comes down and grips him. Yeah. Uh, yeah um, manic depressive, I guess. Yes. Bipolar? Not really, I think. Uh, how about hallucinations? Uh, the, the best one is, yeah, so is in, again, the Bacchic women where, where um, Pentheus has, may I say it this way, a bad trip. <laughs> and, 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 and he sees he sees two sons uh, instead of one, and uh, he, uh, and then in in that process, it turns out that he's trying to be a member of the chorus. Going back to Nietzsche's idea of um, he's dressed as a woman and dressed as a woman, but and usually in in modern uh, stagings, uh, he, uh, he's played as if he were Blanche Dubois. It's mm-hmm. very badly done, <laughs> but but yeah. but in in, in 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 the ancient theater, what's good about it? Is that the reason he looks so grotesque? Is that is that he is misusing ritual, and because he is misusing or abusing ritual, uh, he has a bad trip, mm-hmm. literally. And and, uh, and and there's lots of um, symptoms of of, um, of actually taking drugs and having having a very bad experience. And he's get, he gets killed by his mother because she yeah. thinks he is a stag or something yeah, like that. A, a lion. Yeah, 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 a lion. Yeah, that's right. Yes. Uh, right. So yeah. there's another yeah. hallucination yeah. Uh, on that side. So that's hallucinations are big. Right. Yeah, that's, that's very big indeed. Yes. What was Antigone suffering from? Oh, he was, she was just a nice moral person. <laughs> and and, and it, what's, it, the, the person who's really suffering is the delusional Creon, who is, uh, unfortunately, in, in France uh, and, and also in Greece, uh, Creon comes across as Mr. Tyrant. But uh, again, in, in terms of ancient Greek characterization, he's another radical Democrat yeah. who, who, uh, who's saying, well, you broke the law. And here's the little problem with Athenians use the word nomos in the sense of legislated law. All other Greeks use it in terms of customary law. And Antigone is is just uh, understanding what she has to do to take care of the corpse of her brother as, as common moral decency in terms of customary law. The two of them use the word in a different way, one of them in a very rational 5th century Athenian way, the other one in a very old-fashioned way. I uh, wanted to think of Antigone suffering also. Uh, in addition to being rational yep. and using yep. the language in its inherited form, she does for sure. But she has, uh, it's curious what Sophocles does <coughs> is he probably adds Hymon, Creon's son, to the play, where Antigone is now betrothed to him and she's about to marry. Uh, she's a bride. Uh, but she shows no interest at all in her. And her and her husband to be, and rather is deeply impassioned. And the language of eros, desire on her part for her dead brother, is enormous. Uh, as is her affinity with her father. So she's at this change in her life between going from one house, that is the house in which she, her blood house, into her new house, her marriage house, and all of her language of attraction is to the blood house, whether to the dead brother or to the father. 
But she does complain, doesn't she, that she will die unmarried uh, when she, uh, something yeah. like that. Uh, she, and, and, and she complains like hell because, because she, uh, she dies hard. And, and I think most Greek heroes die hard. It's not that they're they like joyously it, yeah. uh, <laughs> embrace death. Uh, she, she, she really loses her nerve when it's time to die. Uh, which makes it all the more, I think, effective. And and in in the case of of Antigone, who who stands for these older moral principles, uh, as opposed to Creon. And another fascinating thing is that um, in other tragedies like the Seven Against Thebes, you actually have an image of a young girl taking a warrior by the hand and taking him up to the Acropolis to establish him as a king. So in other words, this moral force, um, and Aeschylus saw it, and I'm sure Sophocles saw it, it is something that should reconstitute society. So it's, it's, uh, it, it's just a, a beautiful plot, if I may say so, yeah. and the character is, is, is wonderful. And in a, in a funny way, we uh, oversimplify it with, um, with political stereotypes uh, when, when we retroject ours to them. Could I come back to Thucydides, whom you mentioned at the very beginning? I think there's something absolutely right about what you said, that there's something tragic in Thucydides, the way he looks at things, partly because, again, with Thucydides, he describes this long war that Athens fought against Sparta. Um, things happen, bad things happen for no particularly good reason, just because we don't control the world. Uh, so you plan to do something, and you know who knows the ship doesn't arrive quite on time, or you know the weather plane. is not good, or the, the plane, <laughs> the plane. Yeah, the plane. Yeah. <laughs> and things just fall apart. And yeah. there's no explanation the way that say Euripides might give an yeah. explanation, or even Sophocles in the Oedipus after after he has yeah. blinded himself and he comes out. Remember, he says it was Apollo who did it. Yes. yes. Much less than in Euripides, yes. of course. But there yes. is a sense that there is some sort of explanation there, why Apollo hated him and all that, because yeah. horrible. And since Alexander brought up Apollo, and, we, uh, and he's the expert on Nietzsche, and Nietzsche had that wonderful model of the Apollo and Dionysus forces, uh, we should all note, we Hellenists, that uh, Nietzsche's model has been vindicated in, uh, in the study of Greek tragedy. There are now enough fragments, like, like especially Euripides's um, uh, um, um, Orphic Mm. Trilogy uh, that that th there are these these countervailing forces. For Nietzsche, of course, the hero, the tragic hero, is always a persona, a prosopon of Dionysus. Yeah. Uh, and his, if we can talk about the origin for just a minute, if you don't mind, <laughs> any earlier, <laughs> Early, earlier, <laughs> earlier forms. Yes, thank you. Um, what Nietzsche, uh, the way that he sees tragedy come into being is as follows: uh, he traces it back to a form of uh, uh, sung poetry called the dithyram, which is sung by a group of people. Yeah. And they were, according to Nietzsche now, in, when they start singing and dancing, they become this unified whole that I was talking about before, and they sense the presence of the god within them yeah. and within the group. They sense that the god has come there. As the ritual starts getting formalized, and the god is not so obviously there, one of them starts playing the god. So instead of having the god present, as it was in the beginning, he's now represented. Yes. And from that, you have the division between stage or plot on the one hand and uh, chorus on the other. Yes. And then you take other, uh, yeah. other persona come into the picture, which is a very powerful it, it, image. It's in a a remarkably way, intuitive. You know. and, uh, and he saw things that, that are now being validated. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I was wondering, uh, this is uh, Gareth around the time that we sort of have people come up and, and if you think that would be a good... Uh, Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. If you'd like to come up and have a, ask a question, just come to the mic. Come over here. Say who you are. And we will deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay. Why don't you go and then we'll go. Okay? Oh, thank you. My name is Barbara Meister. Since you all brought up Shakespeare... I was wondering if you thought the experience at the Globe Theater, which was also in daylight, and the people were all together, um, could be compared with the experience at the Greek tragedy where the whole community came. Because it seems to me that even in, that in all the tragedies, in all the important plays, Shakespeare's main aim was to relate the individual story to the community. And the, yeah, the kingdom, yeah. 
Uh, Freud, Freud, answered, Freud addresses that question in Interpretation of Dreams, where he says, and he compares Hamlet to the Oedipus, the Oedipus story, and to Sophocles. Mm. And he says that uh, later cultures have less courage in facing the primal family struggles than does than do the earlier cultures, and he and he reads the Hamlet story as a as a deflected Oedipus story. So that one way that uh, he would respond is that Shakespearean England <coughs> dealing with the same structures uh, as the classical mythic structures uh, softens them, uh, so that Oedipus doesn't. Hamlet doesn't kill his father, or his father's already dead, but he doesn't kill uh, his mother's lover. He kills the uncle, and, and he, he is not quite as the, 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 the triangular structure of family has, has been diluted. Uh, that's one, one. And one question I have about Shakespeare, as wonderful as he is, I'm not sure he is willing to challenge the structure of the cosmos, to explore the fracturing of the structure of the cosmos as much as Greek tragedies, some Greek tragedians are, where this, the world doesn't cohere. The failure of coher- no. cohesion in Greek tragedy reaches a higher level of anxiety, I would say, than you have in Shakespeare. What do you think about the community in the globe oh, here oh, because of the way it was? That definitely, definitely, it goes in that way. It's smaller, right? It's smaller. Uh, and it's also outside the walls. It's it's sort of a it's 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 it's, 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 it's not as uh, it's not the society celebrating itself. It's a little bit the society um, stepping outside of the conventions of, of social. But I would still say that, for example, in, uh, in the Prospero speech at the end of the Tempest, uh, the great globe itself. Mm. Well, we get into the cosmos, the, yeah. the cosmos, yeah. uh, so that so that the globe theater is the microcosm, so to speak, of the macro. Yeah. Well, they also had sex in the globe. Well, there you go. <laughs> what else is there? What do you see in there in the globe? I don't know if the old Greek theater is like that. No. No. no, we don't know. No, well, come on, sorry. come on, let's leave it open. <laughs> okay, <laughs> could be. Get that imagination tell you How much I enjoy this panel. Who are you, by the way? I'm Sri. No I'm Sri Lotan, and I'm a psychoanalyst and psychiatrist, and I intend to play latent content to your manifest content. Uh oh. Um, so uh, I found you all terrific, good, finger licking good. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm wondering uh, the first question is why you didn't say the origin of drama and the origin of tragedy because the subject is Greek drama and Greek drama also contained comedy to which Professor Williams um, alluded in passing that's a that's the topic they gave us. Yeah. Origins of tragedy. All right, but but no, no, but nobody mentioned Aristophanes, uh, who is very they important. Mentioned comedy. Yeah. Good point. So th- th- that's just just a remark. But what I want to and go on correct. to say is that Ari- the Greek drama, Greek tragedy, played a role in the evolution of psychoanalysis. So yes. I want to say a few words about the. Birth of psychoanalysis out of the spirit of tragedy. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Um, and there, here it's historically a fact that the uncle of Freud's wife, Bernays, was an Aristotelian and an expert on Greek drama. And the first treatment As he of psychoanalysis. That's with a purgation. Yeah. <laughs> and apropos purgation, the first name of the therapy, which was introduced by Breuer, Freud's mentor, was called cathartic therapy. So catharsis, which was also renamed abreaction, was indeed the basis of the therapeutic method. And it also started with trauma and the memory of trauma. Not just the PTSD came much later, but the original neurosis that Freud encountered was this traumatic neurosis of Charcot, the railway spine. So trauma was written all over it, and the healing of trauma was remembering the traumatic event, uncovering by recollection through hypnosis, and abreacting the painful affects. So that's, that's a basic fact. Now, what I want also to go on to say is that 
the concept of drama is much more important than tragedy per se, because uh, I'd like to juxtapose the two genres to which you alluded. One is the narrative genre, and one is the dramatic genre. Now, the epos in, in Homer is telling a story, which also includes dramatic scenes. However, drama is all action and dialogue, and there's no description and no narrative. Therefore, I went to Freud and found out the following. That first of all, Breuer describes Anna O, oh, the old patient of psychoanalysis. He says she dramatized what she was feeling. And the verb he used is tragieren. Mm -hmm. Now, tragieren is an obsolete German word. It means to act on stage, to dramatize, and to enact something, enactment. Mm -hmm. Now, Freud, so many decades later, talks about acting out, and the word is agieren. So there is a transition from tragieren, from dramatizing, to acting out. The reason for me being so excited about it is that I propose now a new term, which I call dramatology, as a counterpoint to narratology. So what we deal in life, in therapy and in disorder is dramas, hmm. actions, words, speeches. And uh, I would say that if we combine all your observations and the notion of drama and dramatology, I think we'd be adding something to the theory and practice of psychoanalysis and psychiatry. Thank you. Thank you. Bravo. May I make a comment before, before we go to the next questioner and to, to your, your very insightful statement? Mm -hmm. And I'll try to make this very quick. One is that it turns out that even epic is 100% drama mm -hmm. because the, um, the professional rhapsode who says, tell me, muse, is playing Homer. Mm -hmm. So, so, so even that is a mimesis. Right. That's that's one part. Second part, very quickly, when when Aristotle tries to give you a, a two-word definition for what mimesis is, mm -hmm. which is tragiran and agiran, or if you like mimesis in ancient Greek, uh, he uses the expression hutosekenos, which means this is that, mm -hmm. and and it turns out that if you translate that into vulgar Latin, that would be hoc ilud which becomes, for example, in a Romance language like French, we, oui. yes. So, so the actor who, who is reenacting Oedipus, uh, that actor, Hutos, this one, is that one back in myth. A and so there's a fusion right. which happens in reenactment, yeah. which is Tragira and Agira. Now, I'd also like to add to it that Freud was, of course, uh, imbued by the spirit of Greek tragedy, and yeah. Oedipus is a tragic hero for him. Shakespeare was also a, a great deal on his mind, but then he also did a lot with Ibsen. Now, Ibsen is a modern drama, more like Euripides of ancient times. It deals with the everyday dramas of everyday life, which are then elevated into a dramatic form and performed on stage. So I think yeah. there is an evolution here, but... It's important to understand the dramatic aspect in Freud. From Shakespeare to Ibsen. Yeah. Right, yeah. to Ibsen. Yeah. Now, apropos uh, what you said, uh, Professor Ledoux, about memory, I'll just say one more remark, that Nemosyne is the mother of all the muses, and she's the muse of memory. Yeah. And memory is the basis of everything we live with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. May I just add a very quick um, comment Sorry, to, uh, yes. um, to the Hellenists will laugh at this one, but I wonder whether um, one of the wonders of Sophocles' Oedipus is the famous words Iacasta says, oh, don't worry, Oedipus, most young boys think about being in bed. Why does she say that in the dramatic moment? Is it because Iacasta is way ahead of the game? She sees the full implications, and she tries to normalize Oedipus' response to the trauma that's about to hit. Um, I wonder if in the dramatic movement of the play, her motivation for saying it then is not necessarily tied to a massive psychological framework, but is extraordinarily tactical in the moment. I don't know whether that's... Uh, <laughs> Interesting. I idea. think for a, lad, for a Romanist, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> Shall I leave now? <laughs> You're ahead now, yes. <laughs> 
Thank you. My name is John O'Glara. Um, um, I d just had a couple of points. Uh, uh, one was uh, uh, your mention of the word nachträglich. Yes. And if I remember my Freud, he yes. used it uh, in connection with the, uh, the, the, the woman who was working in the, uh, the, the mountain uh, hut, and she was having these anxiety attacks. And when he began to examine her, yes. uh, he found that um, uh, she, it, it all started when she saw her father uh, having sex with the maid, yeah. and and that's when it started. But Freud said there was uh, the Nachtreglisch being a deferred action, and and therefore it was um, her memory or the repressed memory of her father coming into her room when she was a young girl, drunk, and she sort of realized why her father might be there, and her 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 symptoms of the hyperventilation were perhaps um, a form of orgasm yep. and that she was fulfilling the wish. Yep. So maybe in the, in the tragedies here with, uh, when you talk about Oedipus and whatever, yep. he yep. sort of had this nachtregli yes. too in yes. terms of a... Yes, and, and that's all I meant when I said instead of D, I think I used the letter D, you have D1 and D2, and, and it does go uh, in a whole chain. It right. could be not just two, but even more right. uh, events. Right, okay. And, and I was just curious if I remember my own classic uh, training there. Uh, the word hubris was not mentioned. And I thought that was always a central term in talking about uh, tragedy. Well, yes, indeed. And uh, it often appears in tragedy. Uh, it's a word that goes back to home. Yeah, but I thought that was sort of like the, the, the key of, of what was really creating the tragedy for the, um, uh, the, the, these high-level persons. That was the tragic fault. Yeah, uh, uh, um, among some of them, not among all. Oh, okay. But, uh, it's not an essential component of any, of any character, uh, but it is a characteristic of some of them who are reaching beyond their human station. I see. And, uh, Could I just say very quickly about yeah, yeah. hubris that it's good to divide it up into three categories, um, uh, human, animal, and vegetable. Uh, you, you'll see why. Uh, I'll do this very quickly. So for humans, it's things like, uh, I don't know, uh, 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 building a bridge across the Hellespont or, or uh, all the bad things that Oedipus does, etc. For animals, it's very simple. It's being oversexed or overviolent. And then for plants, let's say, let's take an apple tree, it's having excessive wood and leaf production. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> the tragic of the plant. <laughs> That's where tragedy and comedy yeah. come together. <laughs> uh, my name is Wendy Gittler, and I'm a painter. Uh, I have another word, another etymology of a word, and I want to know a little more about it in terms of tragedy. Uh, the word is irony. I want to know the etymology of irony, and I want to know if any of the characters, the main characters in the Greek tragedy, have any sense of ironic, um, an ironic stance, whether it is the ones who are the oracle or the main character some way or other acquiesce to a destiny, fight it by acquiescing it in, in an ironic way. Uh, uh, Alexander's the expert because he's the philosopher, but, but could I just say, uh, as an etymology person, that, that Aaron, uh, which is where we get irony, is a character who pretends that he's not, or he or she is not um, conversant with a certain craft or with a certain set of experiences. May I say it this way, acts dumb. Mm -hmm. but really knows a lot more than there's another character called the Aladzon, who's the flashy know-it-all, mm -hmm. who is the urbane, um, smooth talker. Mm -hmm. And, and the, best, the best essay on this is by Northrop Fry for me, that noted literary critic at the univers formerly at the University of Toronto, who said that these characters in new comedy are as old as the hills. Mm -hmm. Aaron, the, mm -hmm. um, the seemingly... Um, non-knowing one, and then the Aladzon, the, the one who's the flashy know-it-all. And Socrates, our friend, in Plato's dialogues, is consistently the Aeron. Mm -hmm. And in the tragedies, is there, um, is there, do the main characters, is there any, any implication of irony in their acquiescing to their destiny, or is it an unknown destiny? 
I think that's a more complicated uh, mm -hmm. uh, question because that's a matter of plot rather than character. And here I defer to mm -hmm. Alexander and Steve and, and, and Gareth. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. I, I would say that I, I would be more comfortable with characters and, and just how they play out rather yes. than plots. But. Well, there's the, the irony in the play of Oedipus, of right? There's mm -hmm. a Foucaultian irony. It's where, you know, the audience knows what's going to happen to Oedipus. Mm -hmm. And he says things that you can understand in two ways, although he doesn't realize that. Mm -hmm. uh, when he says things about yeah. the culprit, what I'll do to the culprit and things like that, mm -hmm. he's talking about himself, but he doesn't know that, but the audience does. But I don't know that the irony in, in the modern sense, at least, yeah, where you I don't can. mean what you say or you mean something other, or you give the indication that you're not completely yeah. committed to where, what where it is you're saying. There's the plot. There's there's a, you know, yeah. The character Medea, uh, who, who does know what she's intending to do, um, uh, but is not understood by others necessarily, or another example, they're rare, uh, is Ajax, before he commits suicide, and he gives this most moving speech about time, uh, and how things change in time, which th the members of the chorus and the members of the play think means that he's not going to kill himself. But he understands very well uh, what he thinks about time, and it's because of time and its changeability that he means to exclude himself from time by killing himself. Mm -hmm. So he's using, that's a wonderful example of irony, actually. They're, they're rare, mm -hmm. but that's a perfect example. Right. An another very good one is when Clytemnestra in Aeschylus' Aristotle yes. says how happy she is to learn that her husband's coming home mm -hmm. from war. Yes. <laughs> right, yeah. that's another one. Mm -hmm. But they, they stand out for their unusualness. Yeah. Thank you. Well, that's just a lie. <laughs> <laughs> You have to come to the mic because we can't pick you up. Oh, okay. When it when was said, come up and please go on. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, when it was, when it was uh, mentioned earlier that uh, the hero knowing uh, his fate still proceeds towards that Talotic destiny, mm -hmm. um, although Talos wasn't used that before. No. Um, is that not? Could that not be seen as a form of irony in that uh, he, in fact, he does know what his fate is and yet proceeds despite that fact? I don't know that I would call it irony. I think it's more, it's closer to heroism. Isn't it? I mean, you know, you know that you're going to fail, but yet you try to accomplish something nonetheless. I, I'm not sure. About it. I just, I'm asking because I experience a sense of irony knowing that yeah, someone that's knows he will fail. But Orestes, in any case. Orestes knows that when he kills his mother, he's going to be pursued. Yeah. By the, but I wouldn't call that irony. No. I would more in, in, in Alexander's mode call that just acting in, in awareness of his destiny, mm -hmm. not an irony of his destiny, just an awareness of it and still acting. It's when you don't know, like Oedipus, yeah, where right. irony really kicks in in a way. Thank you. Double in time. I wanted to thank you, gentlemen, yeah. also for a very fascinating conversation. And I was, uh, I'm Howard Ural. Um, I'm an attorney here in the city, and uh, I was uh, appreciating some of my favorite composers. I wanted to put the music uh, mm. into the conversation, uh, especially some of the greats of the 19th century. And uh, the inspiration they took from the Greeks and the Romans and Shakespeare uh, and the production through them of uh, so much wonderful music coming from from tragedy. I'm just wondering what what, uh, what reactions were about uh, music, especially in, well in our times or in the last couple of centuries. Would you be willing to consider previous centuries as well? Mm -hmm. I, I'm thinking now of the, uh, shall we say, origins <laughs> or, or invention of opera, of mm -hmm. classical opera. opera, which is a bunch of humanists reading Aristotle's mm -hmm. poetics and, and saying, we've got to resurrect tragedy or drama and and, uh, and Monteverdi is is exhibit A mm -hmm. and, and and then if I may just stick to opera for just a, a few more seconds uh, as you trace opera forward in time if if we want to give the best living analogy performance analogy to drama and I mean drama in the wide widest sense uh, well then that is opera 
Well, I need to add something here because Nietzsche comes in perfectly. The original title of his book was The Birth of Tragedy Out of the Spirit of Music. And for him, the action is secondary to the chorus. The chorus is what really matters. And it's the musical, the, the dancing and the collective music of the chorus that he really, uh, really cares about. Uh, so, no, there's a lot to be said. Of course, the other name we haven't mentioned is Wagner in connection oh with God. Nietzsche. Yeah. Of course, Wagner gets convinced by Nietzsche, I think, that his play, his music dramas, which are not operas according to him, are the closest thing to Aeschylean tragedy. And the purpose of the birth of tragedy, one of the main purposes, is to say that, oh, Germany will be saved. Yes. German culture will be saved if we can use Wagner, if we can understand Wagner as the uh, sort of the avatar of the of the uh, ancient dramatists and use them precisely for the civic. Yes. So it's not just yes. a town, a yes. city now. It's a, yes. it's a Reich. Uh, yes. You know, yes. to get all everyone together. He gets a bit a bit disabused of that idea soon. And, and, and maybe you know. just fifteen yeah. seconds more. Uh, again, ping pong and going back to opera for just a second. Um, when, when, let's say, there are four characters singing on stage and they're all singing, I'm confused, mm -hmm. uh, what, what's happening is a fusion of all the emotions and a processing, uh, if I may say, of a whole set of emotions. So in Handel's Tamerlane, for example, uh, you, have, you have the most violent man on earth falling in love with a beautiful woman. And, and then you have anger and love Fusing, for example, and this is what opera is all about: is is nice. testing these uh, 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 testing these different instances of pathos, and and uh, and different again, registers. And, and different registers. And these people are reading Aristotle's Poetics, who gives the sort of handbook definition of tragedy. As Mozart, it's a terrific connection. Jumped. Yeah. Yes. Now, as Mozart tells the emperor in Amadeus, right? Yeah. Have four people speak at the same time, and it's just a mess. Have them sing, and it all comes. There you go. Exactly. Exactly. Bravo. Think, Bravo. Think in particular of the quartet yeah. at the uh, last third act of Rigoletto. Right? Yeah. Of, Lovely. You know, which yes. is, you have four very different yes. uh, emotions being expressed at the same time. At the same time. Fusion, and, not and confusion. Fit. Now, that I don't think would go along with... Uh, uh, Contemporary views that they all can can make a nice whole, especially if they can. But I don't know. I mean, Joe has a band, by the way. So that's <laughs> the big Deloids. We play here. We play oh, here. the what? The big Deloids. Oh, wow, yeah. that's very nice. We play here. One more question. Very primitive. Huh? Uh, my name is Carol Berman. I'm a psychiatrist and a playwright, Ooh. and I'm interested in the chorus. And you guys are starting to talk about that. I'm thinking of the chorus as like a collective unconscious yes. that represents. Mm -hmm. yes. Could you say something mm -hmm. about that? Uh, I mean, and I can do the Nietzsche part. <laughs> okay, so, so, so just to be chronological, Alexander, I could talk a little bit about uh, um, Aristotle's scenario of, of how, how individual performance um, uh, emerges out of the chorus. So you have, you have collective singing and dancing, and, and then you have the emergence of the quote-unquote author, the ex archon, uh, precisely in the model of communal singing and dancing. And, and then it turns out that anthropologically you can actually prove this. So, so um, what you're doing, psychiatry and drama, uh, has to have chorus as, as the foundation because the chorus is a singing and dancing ensemble. And, for example, in Sparta, choros was the actual name for the public space. And Herodotus says that. Horos is the public space. It's the agora. It's the yeah. Svi yeah. wants to make one that provide us with yeah. I just want to make one uh, footnote to irony. Uh, I would ask you if the Greek had the notion of wit or humor. Oh. Yes. Mm. Oh, yeah. The stairs. Yes. All right. right. So, yeah. yes. because yeah. humor uh, is also a great subject for Freud, and he makes a distinction between wit uh, and comic, which he takes from Bergson. So the issue here that irony is not simply being a simpleton, but it's a very complex uh, combination of wisdom and humor. Anyway, they did have it. Yeah, yeah. That's the, the short answer. <laughs> Thank you very much.